All right. So listen, uh, praise God as everybody's kind of moving forward. Uh, I did have, so again, just real quick, and I apologize about the announcements because I can't remember everything. So if you want to come to the thing, if you want a chair to sit, you don't have to put your name on there. You just mean I have a chair to sit. So if you don't mind standing all night, you don't even have to sign it. So if you want a chair to sit in, make sure you put your name on there. If you have a guest you want to invite, Go ahead and put that person's name up there. Another thing I wanted to say is we're kind of transitioning on the Sunday nights that I'm off and we can have the little get together that we've been doing. We're going to, we, we kind of like I sent the video out that kind of told you the cliff notes of the book. And so uh, that, the purpose of that was so that you could get a little bit of an idea of what the, the essence of the book was because we're just, we're going to move on from the book. I'm very grateful for the things I learned in the book. But so now what we're going to do hopefully is we're going to focus on scriptures and passages and we're just going to kind of like it flowed really well the last time I thought a mixture of testimonies and, and and scripture and I'm hoping that that we can tackle together some of the passages of scripture that maybe people have had questions about in, in the past amen so that's what we're going to do we're going to come together same format we'll put the table out and we're going to dig into the word and we're going to pray amen and we're going to and we're going to give testimony we're going to let the Lord flow amen so tonight what time have we been doing that five o'clock is that, yeah, yes. 5 o'clock tonight, if you want to come, we're going to have a little get-together over here. It's, it's much less, you know, it's, it's informal, okay? So, anyway, praise God. Thanks, we go with that? All right. So, listen, I titled my message this morning, The Man Who Would Be King. I, I tell you, I'm just being blown away. I don't want to get into too much of this too fast because I'll, I'll end up losing, losing time. But I, I'm just blown away at the richness and the depth of the spiritual truth that I'm finding in this story connected to King David. I mean, listen, I've been studying King David for years. I have seen things in the Word of God that have already 15 years ago blown me away. And to think that the things that I'm seeing now, all over again, I'm just, I'm really, really uh, blown away. Now, one of the things that I want to preface this about is this. Is that, you know, I've been saying this for a long time. And so look, we're all at different levels of our understanding of the Bible. And I need you to understand, there's a movement in the modern church, okay, where even at the old church I used to be in, way back, like this is like probably 15 years ago, when I would teach a Sunday school class at the old church. There was a guy that really loved the Lord, and afterwards he told me, and I know that he wasn't really trying to encourage me. Okay, but it's okay. He said, I just like the way Pastor does it because he writes it in crayon. Because I'm at a third degree. Listen, if you want a third grade walk, you came to the wrong place, brothers Amen. and sisters. This ain't the third grade. We're trying to grow up and become a sure. in Christ, and we're trying to understand what the Word of God says so that the Word of God inside of our hearts and in our lives. Amen. So listen, we're going to try to do our best to explain things, but I promise you, if you'll keep your spirit open, you're going to receive some things. But one of the things that I need you to understand is this is a truth that I think that's a little bit different where the Lord has brought my teaching style that's a little bit different than maybe some of the pre preachers that you've exposed yourself to. And whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, is you, you, you'll decide for yourself what your spirit says about it. Is a simple concept that the Lord gave me a long time ago. Just as Israel, you remember that story I told you back when I was in Lafayette hanging out with the two boys. One, the older brother's name was Israel. The younger brother's name was Christian. And as I began to read the scriptures later on in life, and the Lord began to read, re, he reminded me of the two brothers. He said, you need to understand that Israel is Christian's older brother. You need to understand that the apostle Paul said in the book of Romans that they are our examples. Big brother went before us. All the mistakes he made, little brother was supposed to be watching and seeing the fallings and the failings and understand so that he himself did not fall into the same trap. But as it goes, many times little brother follows in the same pathway as older brother and he has to learn like daddy told me, you're going to be like your old man, you're going to have to go to the school of hard knocks. Because you have a stubborn head and you refuse to learn from the mistakes that I have made before you. And he wasn't even a man of God. And what he said was true. 
Because each and every one of us, if we're honest with one another, can we just take off the religious mask this morning? I hope we can. Let's just be transparent with one another. Each and every one of us, to some extent in our heart and our life, have a little element of rebellion. And we have this little element of what we want. And it's our will versus the Lord's will. And I need you to understand that in these Old Testament passages, there is so much New Testament truth. Don't be scared of the word theology. I'm not trying to get fancy on you. It just means the study of God. There is so much New Testament truth hidden within the depths of the Old Testament. And I'm telling you, that is what I am seeing this morning. So, look, the title of the message is this, The Man Who Would Be King. All right? So my message continues where we left off Wednesday night. If you weren't here, I'm going to try to do my best to bring you up to speed of where well, the point that, that hit me. In, in Wednesday night's message, okay, what, what I came to was the spot in, I taught on First Chronicles. And in First Chronicles chapter 10, if you will remember, I'm just going to talk for quite a bit before we even turn to any passages of Scripture. So, so just, just bear with me right here. I'm going to talk to you about story because, look, I don't need to get fancy on you, but in the Old Testament, much, much of the Bible is actually what you call narrative literature. What does a narrative do? What does a narrator do? He tells a story. So we're going to talk, tell the story, and we're going to let the God, God's Word preach through the story. So in First Chronicles chapter 10, Saul dies. Do you remember that? The, the Philistines find him on the battlefield. He says, run me through with your sword, lest these uncircumcised Philistines treat me improperly. I can't do it. So he ran himself through with the old sword. And then it says that the Philistines found Saul's body the next morning on the battlefield. And what did they do? They took his head. They took his head. And what did they do with it? They put it in the temple of Dagon. Now, who is Dagon? Dagon is the god of the Philistines. They take Saul's head and they put it inside the temple of Dagon, the false god. Now, listen, that doesn't mean a whole lot until you start to look backwards and you move forward and you begin to see the types of what this represents. Now, one of the things that I want to let you know is this, is that one of the first things that Saul ever did when he became king was what did he do? He wanted to go fight the Philistines and he told them to bring the Ark of the Covenant do you know what the Ark of the Covenant represents? The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. If you remember in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, you just got to bear with me. Now, hold on. We're going somewhere. Exodus 25, 8, whenever God was about to bring the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Do you understand that Egypt is a type of the world and that God delivered his people out on Passover night? And Paul said that Jesus is our Passover lamb and that the blood of the lamb was painted on the doorpost and that God delivered them out through the blood of a lamb. Hallelujah. God wants to deliver his people out of the world slash Egypt through the blood of a lamb. He told Moses, build me a sanctuary, Exodus 25 8, that I might dwell with my people. And if you read the whole chapter of Exodus 25, what you're going to realize is this. I want you to build me a tent. And there's going to be a holy place. And there's going to be a veil. And there's going to be a holy of holies. And beyond that veil, there's going to be a box. And on that box is going to be a mercy seat. Because you see, you got to understand, every year, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the place of judgment was turned to a place of mercy. And how was such a thing done? Because God said, you're going to put two cherubim upon that mercy seat. And they're going to look towards one another. And they're going to look down upon the seat. And inside the ark is, a, is my tablets of testimony, my law that I've given to my people. And the law is broken because my people do not listen to me. My people do not keep the law because no man can keep the law. And that's why Jesus had to come to keep the law for us so that he can die and take the penalty of sin upon him so that you and I could be free. But once a year, once a year, those cherubim went from looking at a broken law to what? The high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement. At first, he would bring blood for his own sin. And then he would bring blood for the people. And he would sprinkle it seven times the number of fulfillment upon the mercy seat. And now we see the blood. This place of judgment now turns to a place of mercy. They see the blood. And God said, you will build in me a sanctuary. And in the Holy of Holies, you will put a box. And on top of that box, you will put a mercy seat. And you will put the blood. And there I will meet with you. My presence is right there. My Shekinah glory. My presence is right there on top of that mercy seat. Saul is a type of the flesh, spiritually speaking. 
Why is Saul a type of the flesh? Come on, preacher, you can't come around here with all that stuff if you don't. No, Saul is a type of the flesh because Saul is the will of the people. If you know the story, the people of God at the end of the book of Judges, what did they say? Give us a king. Why did they want a king? Because they wanted to be like all the other nations around them. Oh, if everybody else can drive big cars, I want a big car. If everybody else can live in a big house, I want to live in a big house. If everybody else can dress like this, I want to dress like this. If everybody else can listen to this kind of music, I want to be able to do what I want to do. The world looks glamorous. They're all bleeding and they look good. And the church is dying hook, line, and seeker as it brings the world into the church. And God says, no, my people are to be separate. And God is not okay with some message of relevance that makes everybody feel all fuzzy on the inside because the Holy Spirit brings conviction on the inside of our heart. And he says, get your heart right because I'm coming soon and I need your heart to be connected to me. So it's all the type of the will of the people. And that's the transit, that's the contradiction to what the will of God because see, David is the will of God. And so Saul is a type of the flesh, and David is a type of the spirit. The people said, give us a king. And what happens, one of the first things he does is this. He takes the Ark of the Covenant, and he tries to go fight the Philistines. Remember the story? The Ark got stolen. The Ark got stolen, and what ended up happening is they put it inside Dagon's temple. This happened before they put Saul's head in it. Many, many years before. Dude. God's saying something here. They put the Ark of the Covenant in Dagon's temple. Do you remember what happened the next morning? I said it Wednesday night. Dagon's laid prostrate on the ground in front of the Ark of the Covenant. See, the presence of God is in that temple. The presence of God says, you will bow. Because the word of God says that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, my God, my friend. Oh, yeah. I choose by the grace of God to bow now. I'm not one to wait till that day sometime in the future. They lift up Dagon, and what happens the next day? They go in there, and not only is Dagon on the ground, but look, his head is broke off. His head is broke off. His hands are broken. The word, the head in the, in the Old Testament represents authority. Jesus is the head of the church. We're the body. Look, when the, oh, Lord, you can't, this, this stuff gets so deep. Listen, when the body is not functioning properly and it walks in the flesh, it can sever itself from the head, and now it's not even functioning the way God would want it to do. You're the body. I'm the body. He's the head. Amen. He's the head. Not the pastor. The pastor is an under-shepherd. I work for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're his people. He told me however many years ago in that ballroom bathroom, present my word for the way that it is written and then I will use you. And he said, listen, I don't care what their faces look like. Jeremiah the prophet said their faces are all contorted. No, 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 no. You don't look at their faces. I'm going to give you a word and you're going to speak my word and they're going to do with my word what they need to do with my word. You as his people will either receive it or you won't. Lord, let your word speak. Yes. Yes. The Ark of the Covenant has been taken. The head, the head of Dagon has been broken. The hands represent the work. The, the work of demonic activity broken in the presence of God. That's what we're seeing here. Spiritual activity. The head of Dagon broken. And soon our Lord will crush Satan under your feet. The power of the resurrected Savior living in you, child of God. Oh, that's what he wants. He wants you to be the temple of the living God. He wants the presence of the Lord living in you and operating through you. That the words of truth be spoken to other people that they also might be set free. That's what your purpose is. Not for us just to all come up in here with some kumbaya kind of stuff. And I'm not trying to pick on nobody. I'm just trying to make a point. Not some little fuzzy, oh, wow, that's so deep and it ain't nothing but superficial. No, we need the depth of the Holy Ghost working in us and cleansing us and changing us. God's not okay with complacency. Listen to me. Whenever... Whenever the Ark of the Covenant is inside of Dagon's temple, your first notion will be, man, what happened? How, how God's people have lost the presence of the Lord? Is God weak? God ain't weak. Hold on a second. 
Dude, I was laying in bed studying this. Like, I'm like, wow. God's not the problem in this story, church. God's whole, oh, come on now. God's still doing what he always does. You will bow at my presence, you lying devil. Get on your face. Your head and your power is broken in the name of Jesus. The problem is Saul's flesh. Come on. The problem is the believer's flesh. Come on. That gets in the way of what God is doing. Yes, sir. Oh, we all of us in this place. Sometimes we think we're a little bit more holy than we ought yes, to. Sometimes we think, oh, we're so full of faith. When in reality, many times we're so full of flesh. Mm. I'm preaching to the preacher first. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we just walk around here and think, oh, God's handyman for the hour. No, 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 no. If you've been called by God, it's a gift that he gave yeah. to you. And it's not free. Oh, it's free to you, my friend. But it calls Jesus his life. Yeah, he yeah. shed his blood on Calvary. Hallelujah. For you. Thank you, Lord. So that the presence of God can live in you. Thank you, Jesus. And in the middle of those two stories, Saul losing the ark and Dagon falling on his face like the little weak God that he is. And then Saul's head ending up in the same place. In the middle of those two stories, what do we have? The young shepherd boy. Showing up on the battlefield on that day to bring wine and cheese to his brothers. And he sees that lying devil, Goliath by name, calling out the people of God. And David said, I don't know what the problem is here, but this uncircumcised Philistine's about to bite the dust. Because I've been killed lions and I've already killed bears as I spend time in the presence of the Lord. And the fast forward version, David sunk a rock in that giant's head, took his sword, cut it off. Hallelujah to the name of God. Took the head of that lion devil. See, we're talking about authority. We're talking about the spiritual authority right here. David, a type of the Christ. David, a type of the Spirit of God. Why? Because he's God's choice. Yes. He's God's choice, Israel. He's God's choice, Christian, because he's a type of Jesus. And he foreshadows the truth of what God is doing upon this earth. And it doesn't even make any sense because it's just like this little shepherd boy. And everybody's laughing at him. Oh, there's one laugh when he wants to get annoyed. Remember that? I told you the story. I love that story. You know, Samuel went to go anoint the, prop, the next king. And you ain't got no more? This isn't the right one. They had to call young Dan. There's one boy. He's just a little lad. He's in the, shit. He's in the, the field with the sheep. And however they called him, I don't have time. I'm, I think I'm going to write a book about this. But anyway, I felt like they're probably doing a show for. I told y'all that Wednesday night. I'm sorry I'm re-preaching my mess. And he comes running. The prophet of God is Bethlehem. Dude, that's a big thing. And I, and I told y'all this the other night. It's the first time it hit me while I was preaching. Wonder what that all felt like. Rolling down his face. That warm anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now look, I saw something again last night. It wasn't even in my message, but I can't hold back from it. I got to tell you. I never saw this before. At the end of, of 1 Samuel chapter 17, after David has cut Goliath's head off, dude, this is so good. How I missed this in the past, I don't know. If you go back and you read, well, let's go ahead and do it. Look, y'all, y'all gonna have to just bear with me. We go to church three, twice a week. All right, so just bear with me. All right, look, the Lord is gonna speak this morning. Yes. Let's look at this. Last verse, I want you to see it. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul. Look at this. Wait, hold on. Wait. Look at that highlight. With the head of the Philistine in his hand. I ain't never even saw that before. So, so look, Abner says, come on, son. <laughs> come on, boy. You're going to talk to the king right now. Go, go on, bring that head with you. Let's go. We got evidence. You want to talk about signs and wonders? Oh, come on. I got the head of the enemy in my hand. Because he is the glorious glory. Okay, but look at this. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. And look at this. There's no division of chapters. There's no division of verses in the original language. We just transition straight into chapter 18. Look what it says. As the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Wow. Do you even get that? You know who Jonathan is? Jonathan is Saul's son. Jonathan is Saul's son, and he's in the presence of his father, the king. 
Do you realize that this throne is, is theoretically, logically, is supposed to transition to Jonathan? And Jonathan is standing there next to me, his daddy, who is currently the king. And all of Israel is already aware that before, or the word's got to be leaking by now that young David's been anointed to be the next king. And all I'm trying to tell you is that some kind of, have you ever had a spiritual epiphany before? Where you just, what do you mean by an epiphany? Like a light bulb goes on. Like you've been wandering in this exodus of Christianity, in the, in the wilderness, and all of a sudden the Lord breaks through. And boom. I'm telling you right now, with all of my heart, Jonathan had a spiritual revelation. Yeah, yeah. He's sitting here saying, this is my daddy. Who's dressed up like a king. Come on. And here's the one that was anointed and he's holding God. Goliath's head in his hand. Hallelujah. And what does it say? His soul was knit to David at that moment. Listen to me, child of God. That this is when you recognize the anointing. I'm not talking about the anointing of a man. Oh, no, no, no. Don't let us focus on the anointing of man. Oh, they got men left and right, women left and right. I'm this of the Lord. I'm that of the Lord. No, you better leave me to Jesus, brother, because he's the anointed one. And David, as a type of Christ, is the anointed one. And when he saw the works of that enemy to, to sever in the hand, he said, no, 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 no. that's the one. Right there. That's the one I want to knit myself to. Yes. Let's just keep going because I don't want to get ahead of myself. So the problem isn't God's, God's power. It was Saul's flesh. And we see right here a truth that David is the power of the Spirit of God. When David defeats that Philistine champion, he cuts off his head, he takes his armor. And now when we visualize Saul's head in Dagon's temple, we gain New Testament truth. See, when the people of God walk in the flesh, it leads to death. And when the people of God walk in the Spirit, it leads to to life. You need some New Testament truth to back that up. I got it for you right here, my friend. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, okay. but to set the mind on the spirit is life yes. and peace. Yes. David is a type of the spirit of God. Who will you follow, Christian? Are you going to follow the victorious, follow the victorious warrior? who is going to lead, who is Jesus Christ himself, who's already gone before you and won the victory, or will instead you do the opposite of our master? I'm talking to I'm preaching to the preacher trust. So don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what the word says. I'm not saying you are, I'm just saying you don't do that. <laughs> Jesus was in the garden and he said, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that is the age old battle of Christian on the journey is that he wants his own will. He wants his own will, and he buys into what the church is saying that the will of God is. Your best life now, garbage. If it's supposed to be my best life now, then what I got to look forward to? It ain't going to be my best life now because God said his streets are paved in gold. God said he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I don't want my best life now. I, I want everything he wants to give me. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm looking, listen, dude, this life is a vapor, my friend. Yeah, that's right. James said it. This is a vapor. This is temporary. This is a dress. Little Raymond, he'll say, this is a dress rehearsal for eternity. What are we going to do? Who are we going to serve? Help us, Lord. Amen. Praise God. Now with Saul dead in the story, we're going to shift our attention to the next movement. David is king. And this is what he said. Let me turn there real quick. 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So let's discuss some backstory here. Again, I already told you, Jonathan was Saul's son. He would have been next in line to rule as king once his dad would have died. But he understood that David was the rightful heir to the throne. Now I want you to see this in 1 Samuel chapter 18, <coughs> verses 3 through 4. Oh, it says, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Now I want you to see this in verse 4. This is big time stuff. So you got it. David's already got the revelation. Or this is the time that he's getting the revelation. Because this is right after he sees 
David holding Goliath's head, and all this is going on. And look what it says in verse 4. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan, I didn't plan to do this, but why not? Jonathan strips himself of the robe. I didn't plan that. Okay, I, I just threw that best on for a while. Know why. Jonathan strips himself of this robe. Now listen, I don't know. We're not told to intermediate all the details in between the scripture. But do you think for one second the prince of Israel didn't have a special robe on? Do you think for one second that the theoretical next in line to the kingship, that that robe didn't have significance? Do you think for one second, knowing what you know about the little bit about kings and movies that you've watched and shows that you've seen, that that robe was not of some special significance to show his identity, to connect him to the royal house? I'm here to tell you, listen to me, you can't get past this. Jonathan took the royal robe off and he gave it to David because he recognized the anointing had been placed on David to be king. So he's basically saying, I see it. You're the king. I'm not the king. This doesn't belong to me. This belongs to you. I'm going to take it off. Hallelujah. That's the title of my message. The man who would be king. And listen to me, church. Every last one of you in this place is the man who would be king. Right. Because right. we're all walking around with our royal robe on, holding on to all, all kinds of parts of self, refusing to release it to the king of kings and the lord of lords. And many times we're walking around saying, not your will be done, right. Right. but my will be done. And there's things that the Lord's been dealing with our heart and holding on to it. And we're holding on to it. And I ain't trying to make you feel all funny, but let the Lord have his way. Have your way, Lord. Jonathan made a covenant with David and he took that robe off. You know, I had a question. Who does such a thing? No, we're not getting it, church. I mean, okay, it's a big deal. It's a Bible. No, we're not getting it. Half the time, we can't come off 20 bucks out of our pockets. Right. Come That's on, right. I'm just trying to make it real quick. Right. I'm not talking to you. If you gave somebody 20 bucks yesterday, praise God. Kudos, let me give you some knuckles. I'm trying to make a point. What is it, that thing that we hold on to in selfishness? What is it that, oh, no, this is mine. I'm going to stand up for it. I'm going to fight for it. Oh, oh, oh. And then we get in the flesh over. You know how you know it ain't the Lord? Because you're in the flesh, my friend. You're, you're feeling irritation. You're feeling frustration. That's not the God of glory. He's the Prince of Peace. Whenever you're flowing in the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, the peace of God. Because the Prince of Peace is having his way. So if you're all rattled up and you're frustrated, I'm here to commit to you. I'm here to present to you that you are operating in your flesh, my friend. So just so that you can recognize it the next time. That it's not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit brings peace in the midst of the most tribulous of circumstances. So if you got yourself all riled up and you're getting all sweaty over it, guess what? Good chance you're here. But I don't walk in and say, oh, come on. Come on, come on. Help us, Lord. Who does such a thing that's going to say, I don't want to be king? It doesn't belong to me. I'm going to tell you who does it. Jesus. What are you talking about? He condescended, friend. Hebrews chapter 2 says that he lowered himself. He bypassed the angels so that he could save the seed of Abraham. Though he was in the form of God, Philippians chapter 1, he did not consider it something to be grasped to, but instead he lowered himself so that he could become a man, so that he could serve. What kind of service? The service of the cross, the death of Calvary, so that he could free you, so that he could free me. That's who does that. Who else does it? The people of God. The true people of God, when the true Christ rests in their heart, the scriptures such as prefer your brother over yourself. See, all this bitterness and all this frustration and all this irritation and all this self-righteousness and all this critical spirit that we got living on the inside of it, it's a bunch of garbage and it's demonic and it's lies from the enemy. And if we don't check it and we don't let the Lord deal with it, it's going to hinder the work of God in your heart and in this church. Help us, Lord. 
help us, Lord. Reveal it to us, because you don't need me to reveal it. You need the Holy Spirit to reveal it. Amen? Who else does this than true believers? They lower themselves for the sake of the true king. I'm going somewhere with this. What humility. Listen, he's giving up his right to the throne. We should all feel convicted right now. With the way we selfishly try to make positions for ourselves. And we step over others to try to make sure we're blessed. Even if it's not what the Lord wants. We want it and that's really all that matters right now. This is what I want, Lord. So I'm going to go ahead and keep walking in this. No, 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 no. Lord, forgive us whenever we've gone the wrong way. Lord, forgive us. We sometimes, listen, do you agree, Christian, that sometimes we can't even see ourselves? Yeah. Yes. Sometimes we can't even see what spirit we're operating in. Yes, that's right. And we need the Lord to reveal it to us. Yeah, Lord, help us. Oh, what are you talking about? Oh, okay. What, what, did, what did the sons of Zebedee tell Jesus? When they went through Samaria. That's a long backstory, but look, I'm just going to make it simple. When they went through Samaria, John and James, the sons of Zebedee, said, Can we call out far from heaven like Elijah did on them? They're rejecting you, Master. He said, You don't even know what's spiritual. Mm-hmm. You don't even know you are calling out far from heaven mm-hmm. on people that are lost. Yeah. <laughs> what, about, what about calling down the presence of God to change their heart? Yeah. But that's what we want. Vengeance is mine, says me. <laughs> no, that's not what the scripture says. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. See, as a matter of fact, sometimes whenever, if you believe the way I believe, there ain't nothing happening in your life that God is not aware of. Right. Oh, is there not the truth that people are like hellions and <laughs> like living in straight up rebellion and that sometimes their life will cross your path and cause all kinds of disturbance? And, yeah. But you think God didn't allow that? That's right. You think God could stop that? So if you find yourself in all kind of mess or situations taking place in your life that's causing a bunch of confusion and frustration and irritation, <laughs> what you need to do is quit looking at everybody else and looking at all the situations that you might need to and I might need to look in the mirror and say, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Because there's a good chance that the Lord's trying to get a hold of you and I. And you know what? They're knocking on the door, but you keep saying, nevertheless, let my will be done and not yours. And at the same time, thinking that you're saying, your will be done, not mine, but in reality, it's my person. Help me, Lord. Yes. Yes. Help, me, Lord. Help us. So David and Jonathan were the closest of friends, and they made a covenant. Let's look at that. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 14 through 15. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord. That I may not die. Look at this boy, how powerful. See, he recognized the anointing. He knew who the king was. He knew this was going to happen. Church, do you not know who your king is? I know you do. Do you understand the anointing on the Lord? Do you understand that he's coming back again for his kingdom? Do you understand that we are his people called by his name? Do you understand that one day we will rule and reign with him? And that we're getting caught up like some little chickens in the chicken yard. Like we put our head down looking for the next little thing to peck on. To get our next little kernel of corn. And the Lord is like wanting to do lift us up with the wings of eagles. So that we can see what's really going on in the kingdom of God. And what he's doing and how he wants to use us. Yes. You know he does. Amen. He says and do not cut off your steadfast love for my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Do you know how many, how many scriptures in the Psalms this, this is talking about? Whenever the Lord says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Yes. God is going to take this earth back, my friend. Yes. He is in the process of doing it right now. The nations are in rebellion against God. Even the old leadership. I don't care what your party affiliation is, but I'm telling you right now, if you think the Republicans are all right, look, I believe in conservative government. I believe in giving the people freedom to flourish. I believe in all of that stuff. I believe in being patriotic. I believe in freedom and liberty. I believe in all of that good stuff. But I don't believe that I can trust not one of the politicians. Amen, one. I ain't put my hope in no trust in no man. Amen. Get in the voting booth. Pray about who you need to vote for. Vote! But let me tell you something. If you put your hope and trust, look, I'm going to say it. I'm going to get somebody, man. You put your hope and trust that Trump's coming back. Look, I love me. Look, I like the way Donald Trump talks the truth. But listen to me. You better, you better keep one eye open when you're looking at old Donnie boy. Amen. Because anytime, you know why I'm saying that? And I know that it probably irritates some people. But I, listen, I want you to understand something. When it comes to Trump, I was t- touting Trump when everybody else was on Ted Cruz way back in the gap. Mm-hmm. Why? Because he was wanting to punch the bully in the eye. Mm-hmm. China. 
Okay? So I was all about that. But look, when I read the scriptures and I see what's going on, and I see the church world talking about he's coming back in August, he's coming back in November, he's going to come and he's going to save us, and all of this kind of stuff. I'm like, look, dude, you're looking at this man like he's the Christ. Yeah. No, the Christ is already come. You better get your eyes back on Jesus. Because the world and the church is being prepared for great deception. The enemy don't care about the world. They're already blind. They're already going to hell. You know who the enemy wants? He wants God's people. So all I'm trying to tell you is just be aware. That's all I'm trying to say. Just be aware. Quit and listen. You can fill yourself with all that news, but I'm here to tell you, oh, I fired Fox News preacher. Because they were lying on the election. Right? They probably were. They've been lying to us. And guess what? If you ain't careful, news bags will start lying to you. They all gonna lie to you. Because guess what? They ain't none of them right. There's only one that's right. His name is Jesus. You better learn. There it is. We better learn what this book says right here. Because if we, if we don't, we're going to get deceived. Yeah. All right, I'm done with that part. Let's help, help us, Lord. <laughs> so David and Jonathan were closest of friends, and he says, Lord, show me. Show me mercy all the days of my life. And that brings me back that after Saul died and Jonathan died on the battlefield, the king David said, is there not someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? That's 2 Samuel uh, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 3. We read verse 4, but look, look at verse 3. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul? I wanted you to see this part, because he didn't say it in verse 4 or, the, or in verse 1. That I may show the kindness of God to him. Oh, man, dude, this stuff is so good. And, and so he said, and the king, David said that. Is there not someone? And look what Ziba said, his servant. To the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. Well, hold on a second. I mean, maybe I'm going too far with this. But did that man ask you if he was crippled? <laughs> did that man ask you if that other man was crippled? No, he didn't. What the Lord started showing me is that everybody wanted to look at everybody's past. Everybody's wanting to look at everybody's faults. Why don't you just go ahead, um, to all of you, and myself included, and why don't we just go ahead and take our busy, little messy, little gossipy self out of the equation? And why don't we start recognizing, oh, did you know so-and-so was doing such and such? Did you realize da 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 Did you realize boom, 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 boom? Look, dude, get over it, because you've got stuff in your own life. we got stuff in our own life. Every last one of us has stuff that we need mercy from the master. Yes. And we're over here focusing on everybody else. Like, man, I ain't that bad. <laughs> Thank God I ain't that bad. No, if you can't see yourself, the most dangerous of sins is the spirit of religion. Oh, yes. oh but I'm not Catholic. I said it. <laughs> well, I'm not of a legalistic denomination where I gotta wear my clothes a certain way and blah 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 and women can't shake their legs or whatever. I'm not of that. Okay, well what are you? What is it that's legalistic about you that you think you got something figured out and you can't even see your own self because the spirit of religion will blind you and make you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. No, Lord, convict us in our hearts. Convict us in our heart. And when we see that person that's struggling, let our heart be broken with compassion. And instead of us looking at their faults, instead of us looking at the fact that his legs are crippled, let us come to you, O oh Lord, and with a heart that's broken for your child that belongs to you, that you purchased with your blood, let us cry out and let us say, Lord, please touch them. Because we don't even know the burdens and the weights that they've been carrying around. We don't know the sins that they didn't even need to get themselves involved in. And I'm so busy looking at everybody else's mess, I can't even see my own. Yeah. Lord, help us. Yes, Jesus. Man didn't ask if he was crippled. He asked if there was anybody left that he could show the kindness of God. Yeah, That's nice. what Jesus is wanting to do, my friend. He's wanting to show the kindness of God to some people. Thank you, Jesus. And the king said unto him, where is he? The king said unto him, where is he? 
And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. As a side note, Lodabar means literally without pasture. So it implies a barren land. A barren land. Three things to know about this. I've already mentioned one of them. He didn't ask you whether he was crippled. He just wanted to know if there was anybody he could bless. Mm -hmm. Number two, just as David's heart longed to show mercy and kindness. So this is so good right here. i got to slow down a little. Just as David's heart longed to show mercy and kindness to anyone related to Jonathan because of the covenant that they made, God desires to show mercy to anyone that is related to Jesus through the blood because of the covenant that God made with humanity through Jesus. It's a perfect type of recovery right here. In other words, God's graciousness towards us because of Jesus' faithfulness towards the Father. See, it wasn't you. There was a time in my life that I just knew I was God's handyman for the hour. Oh, man! Look, I didn't know what to do when the anointing hit me. I'm like, oh, yeah! I'm alive now, boy! Look at all this word I'm learning on. Just a bunch of garbage. Spirit of pride. Spirit of religion had, it, had its way in my heart. Take using the anointing of God for the wrong thing. He wants to show mercy. In other words, God's graciousness towards us because of Jesus' faithfulness to the Lord. So, Father, do you realize that, that you ain't the faithful one that He is? And that, yes, in Christ we can receive the strength we need to be faithful to the Lord. But if you start waking up and you throw your big 10s or 12s over the side of the bed and you think, like, I am the faithful one of God. I have woken up again and I have breath in my lungs and I shall take on the day. <laughs> no, that ain't the Lord. And I'll prove it to you before it's over. When we serve the Son, we please the Father. Come on, saints. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to die for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your obedience to go to the cross. Thank you, God in heaven, for having a plan to set us free. Thank you for revealing truth to us. Thank you for sending the most precious object heaven ever held to this fallen, dirty earth so that we could see you, so that we could get a glimpse of your glory, so that we could have access to your presence, so that we could be changed and used by you, so that one day we can realize in glory that we got to rule and reign with you. Praise God. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but you know my, my daddy was a football player and he used to say, boy, let me tell you something. Don't you sit on that bench. I know I've told you this before. Don't you let that coach put you on that bench, boy. You get up and you start irritating him. And I'm like, dad, no, you do it. And you put it in. And you put you in that game. You better give it everything you got, boy. You better get now. My dad was too hardcore, but I'm just trying to make a point. If we take this into the kingdom of business, when you get in, when it's your turn, give it all you got, son. Give it everything you got. And what I realize about the kingdom of God is that Jesus has already won the victory. Yeah. Jesus has already won the victory. I don't know the word of God says it, but look, God has allowed things to play out. Why? Because he wants you and I to be part of it. Yes. He's allowing you and I to partake in it. He has chosen to do it. I can get real philosophical on you, but that's what I personally believe. The angels of glory had celestial eyes and still defied the king of glory. Mm -hmm. They saw him. Do you understand what I'm saying? The fallen angels I'm talking about. They saw him. They were in his presence. That's right. And they rebelled. Yes. Mm -hmm. And here you and I are with terrestrial eyes, earthly eyes. Mm -hmm. Cannot see most of the time the spiritual realm. And he requires us by faith to believe that he's doing these things on earth, that his words. Yes. If you and I don't know, know his word, then we're going to perish. Right. He said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Yes. That's how we allow the garbage to go on that's yeah. going on in the church world yeah. today. Because right. we don't understand the word of God. Mm -hmm. And we turn it on and they throw a little bit of scripture out there and we're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I know I'm making fun. It's, I don't mean to do it, but I mean, no, I do mean to do it. Because we're like, oh, it's so good. And look, he just, he just quoted the scripture, but he quoted it out of context. Satan did that to Jesus. Yeah. 
Okay, so that was it. That was number two, that, now number three. But now that you brought it up, how did he become crippled? <laughs> and now, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm kind of interested now. You brought it up. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Look at this. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse, or his nanny, whatever you want to call her, caregiver, took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So this is the one that King David asked Ziba, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may bless him with the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake? Yeah, there's a crippled fellow that's living in Lodabar. His name is Mephibosheth. Now I want you to see this because look. Mephibosheth is crippled through a fall. He's crippled through a fall that's not even really all his fault. Right. Well, that's not fair, God. I didn't sin like Adam sinned. No, but you received the sinful nature. See, the fall of man, look at this, has left man crippled. He can't function right. Mm, that's right. I want you to also understand that the word Jezreel, that's where the word came from, right? He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. The word Jezreel means God sows seed. <laughs> so the very place where the bad news came from was called God sows seed. Seed. Does God sow bad seed, Christian? No. no, never. As a matter of fact, there's a parable in Matthew. No, God sows good seed. It's when the men sleep that the enemy comes and he sows tares. He sows, he sows false seed. Mm -hmm. Right? No, God sows good seed. Well then, what about this bad news? Do you not agree that tragedy, brokenness, heartache, and pain, look, it's worsening for the house of Saul. Saul Saul's head is up in Dagon's temple. Saul's offspring is crippled, okay? Mm -hmm. Tragedy in the, is setting the stage, though, for God to display mercy and grace. Never forget, Christian. See, we're always fearful about the bad things that we go through. And many times when we're in the valley, we can't see the mountaintop. But we need to understand, God is setting the stage for him to be able to display his mercy and his grace. And don't forget that for those who love the Lord, all things, Romans 8, 28, work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So what are you going through today? Because I need to just sit down and talk with you. What are you going through today in your personal life? Who's coming against you? What are you being attacked by? Why, whatever you feel like you're going through and you feel the heavy weight and the heavy burden, listen to me, Christian. I'm trying to tell you the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that God does allow things to happen in the lives of his people. Why? So that their eyes would be open, so that their ears would be open, so that in their desperation they would cry out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he would begin to reveal things to them. So listen to me. I'm, this is just something for you to think about. If you've been praying, Lord, Lord, take this thing from me, maybe you need to change your prayer. Yeah. Lord, Lord, change this situation. Maybe you need to change your prayer. The Apostle Paul prayed that. I, I sought the Lord twice. Remove this thorn from my flesh. What did Jesus say? My grace is sufficient. Because, see, in your weakness, Hallelujah. my strength is made perfect. Hallelujah. 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 Mm. And so, Mephibosheth has fallen and is crippled, and he lives in a town called Lodabar, which means a barren place. Boy, does that not sound like a human race to you? Mm -hmm. He has fallen, crippled, and barren, and he needs the help of King David so bad man, which is us, by the way, is fallen and crippled and barren, and we need the Davidic king so bad, and his name is Jesus. But Mephibosheth needs, the, needs David the king. You and I, as a type of Mephibosheth, fallen and barren, need the Davidic king. What are you talking about? The prophecies of death. That Messiah would come from him. 
2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. And look at this part right here. Let me go ahead and just highlight that part. You will eat at my table all day. We need a quick rewind before we move forward. What did Jonathan do? You remember what he did? He removed his royal robe and he submitted to David as king. He submitted to God's will and he, hum will and he humbled himself and now what does his son do? He falls on his face in front of the king and says, Behold, I am your servant. And what does David say? You shall eat at my table always. And now this is the part that might make us all feel a little uncomfortable. If we are not ready. Imagine this little crippled fellow at the table of the king. Now, I can't prove to you what a king's table looks like, but I can promise you it don't look like ours. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Even you might have the best dining room table in the house, but your table don't look like king's table. I had some pictures, but look, let's just try to imagine. It's probably a big old room with a long table with a bunch of chairs and a big old spread of food. And it's probably more significant than the cruise I went on back when I graduated nursing school. They had six meals a day, and dude, there was just food everywhere. And it probably had more seats than what you could imagine. I started to think about this kind of situation, though. While there's probably multiple places to sit, probably a lot of regulars, each, you know, for the most part, every day. And, but always new guests, too. Surely, oh, you've been invited to be a guest of the king. Can you not imagine that? I mean, I can't prove it to you, but I'm, I know that they have that happen. You're going to be, you've been invited to be a guest of the king at his dinner celebration tonight. So, new guests from time to time, okay? But one person given access all the time. The food. If he wants it, he's got a place at the table. The table of the king. Now, this is Mephibosheth. He's the crippled one. You know, maybe you're in here right now personally for you. Maybe you're in here tonight and you think you're beyond repair. No, you're not. Maybe you're watching on video and you think, no, I've gone too far. But you know you're not. You haven't gone too far. I'm going to tell you right now, you have not gone too far. The Lord will minister to you. He will restore you. He will invite you to sit at his table. Hallelujah. He will just bow in the presence of the king and say, behold your servant. But I just wanted to say that the one constant was that whoever the guest was, they would see Mephibosheth, the humble one. Who is that crippled dude that's always here? Every time I come, he's there he is. I mean, it's a big old crowd of people. They might not, oh, and the next guy, I'm, I'm, this is my little comment here. The next guy's like, I don't know his name, but what I hear is that he's the one that, that the king showed kindness to for Jonathan's sake. That's the word out on the street, anyway. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. The man who would be king. He gave our king his robe. Yeah, I did hear about that. Can you see yourself doing that? God, take the king's robe. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you because you're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Take the robe. Take the place in the heart. This is your throne space. This is where you belong. See, what we're witnessing here, my friend, is New Testament truth coming alive in the Old Testament. Specifically, what I'm saying to you is that you don't see the Bible focusing on anyone trying to elevate themselves or be the authority head in this part of the story. The last person that tried to do that ended up with his head in Dagon's temple. Mm -hmm. No, all we see here is humility. Jonathan taking off his robe and giving it to the king. Mephibosheth bowing and saying, behold your servant. That's humility. You don't hear anyone saying, I'm the pastor. I'm the teacher. I'm the, I'm the evangelist. No, you don't see none of that. What you see is, behold your servant. 
Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Oh, no, I didn't bring humility to your heart because, look, it's either going to produce humility and softness when you see this crippled dude, whether he's crawling or lifting around, or it's going to cause disgust in your heart. Oh, and I'm not just talking about physical crippledness. That's not even what I'm trying to talk about. I'm just trying to talk about something that you see in somebody that you don't like. Yeah. And it's either going to solve your heart towards them or it's going to make you get all religious. Yeah. And I would imagine that there were plenty of people that were doing that. And then now, now, the, now the, the, the person with the other mindset was there. Oh, preacher, he said, I no longer, Jesus, talking about Jesus, I no longer call you sir, but I call you friend. That, that I'm already ready for. Oh, no, but that's not what Jesus, that's the Old Testament preacher. In the New Testament, Jesus said, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend, because the servant doesn't know what his master's doing, and I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what he calls you. <laughs> that's what he calls you. That's why you're sitting at the table with him and yet. He calls you friend, means that's why you're sitting at the table. But that's not what you're supposed to say about yourself. That's not how you're supposed to see yourself. We're supposed to see ourselves as behold your servant. Yes. What are you talking about? Matthew 20, verse 20. Then came the mother of Zebedee. And she with her sons. And she, she sits down and she asks the king, Hey, when you come into your kingdom, can my son sit one on your right, one on your left? And Jesus says, Do you even know what you're asking? Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Oh, yeah, we can drink it. And Jesus says, Yeah, you're going to drink it. I'm pretty sure he's saying something between the lines. You're going to drink it, but it ain't going to near be what you think it is. Mm -hmm. That's right. You ain't, it ain't going to be what you think it is. You think you're going to be over there with the big old golden chalice? I'm a friend of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Man, you're going to suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. You're going to suffer persecution upon this earth, but I will give you the strength that you need in order to live for me. Yes. Yes. I want to empower you in order to live for me. He goes on to say this. He says, it says, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation. So the other ten disciples, when they heard this, they made them angry. Jesus calls them all together. He says, listen, this is what I want to tell you. So listen to me, man of God, woman of God, if you happen to be watching on the video. Look, this is what Jesus said. The princes of the Gentiles, that means leadership, authority positions in the world, Exercise dominion over their followers. Do you can you interpret the scripture? A he says they exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Right out of the words of your master. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. Right. Matthew 23, Jesus said, the Pharisees loved to sit in Moses. They loved to make broad their phylacteries. It was a box where they put scripture on their head. And the bigger it was, the more holy they were. They liked to make broad their garments. Look at my righteous robe. Look at my holiness. Look what I do for the Lord. The Bible says, let not your right hand tell your left hand on the Or vice versa. They made broad their phylacteries. They enlarged the borders of their... Oh, look at this. And they loved to be called of men, Rabbi. Rabbi. Oh, that sounds so good. It smells good. Sounds good, smells good, that you recognize my authority. Young man, it's time you call me pastor. It's time. You know, you know what part of okay, you got in my head about this? Look, let me just tell you real quick. So I remembered something that happened to me a long time ago when we first started this church. There was a gentleman that asked me to go preach at, at a thing that he was doing. It's a long story, so I'm not going to get into all the details. But later I realized his whole plan was to get money to put in his pocket so he could move his family to Tennessee. And had he asked me, I would have given him some money. <laughs> okay. But so I was like, brother, yes, absolutely. I will preach. Well, when I walked into the sanctuary, his brother comes up to me and he says, I'm the prophet of the Lord. And the prophet's in the house. The other fivefold ministry must submit. Something like to that effect. And he meant it. 
<laughs> and I was like, nah, he didn't mean that. That was just kind of messing. No, no, no. He didn't have a smile on his face when he said it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> The other day I was driving back from Homa and I got a phone call from somebody and if you happen to be watching, listen, you know what, just take the correction that is yours, but if you did say some things that I'm going to the Lord. So it's somebody I hadn't talked to in 50 years. I used to go to church with him somewhere else. Mm-hmm. He called me up and I have him still on my phone. My old contacts are still in there, but anyway. And, it, and I knew who it was and he said, is this Brother Matt David? I'm like, yes, sir. Brother Matt's sister died, Danielle's husband? Yes, sir. Well, listen, bro, the Lord's been working in me through the prophetic. And I woke up this morning and I was praying, and the Lord didn't work for you. I'm like, okay. You know, look, I'm all ears. And listen, I've had the same attitude I used to have. I told you all I used to get critical, but I'm like, all right, I'm all ears. Give it to the Lord. And so he said, you've been fasting and praying, and you've been asking God to move. We've been praying. Move, God. Right? So that part was true. And then he said, Something to the effect of this. He said, he said, and God is going to use you to start opening up other churches. Okay, just hold on. So at night, honest, I called her one time. I was like, hey, what do you think about if we ever try to open up another church? So it's not like it's never been in my head. So I'm like, all right. But I've never felt a true release to do that. I wouldn't do nothing like that way. But I'm like, all right, well, that's something that I've thought about before. But this is the part that I'm trying to tell you. And you will no longer be called pastor, but you will be called a boss. Mm-hmm. Nah. Not interested. Not interested. I'm not interested in none of that monkey shop. I don't want you to call me rabbi, rabbi. I don't want you to call me apostle. I don't want you to call me prophet. I'd rather you call me witness. I'd rather you say he was a witness for the Lord. He lived for God. But listen, I'm not going to problem with the titles. If the titles are there, I don't have a problem. God calls some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. I'm starting to embrace the whole concept of pastor. Make me compassionate, Lord. But I'm here to tell you, I don't want to be the one that the Lord was talking about and want to hear you whisper or sing the words of rabbi, rabbi in my ear. It's a spirit behind that garbage. And listen, it's a religious spirit that man is trying to elevate himself. And they go around calling themselves all these kinds of things. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that no, let the Lord do it. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. First Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Amen? Amen? Proverbs 26, 25, verses 6 through 7. Do not claim honor in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men, for it is better that it be said to you, come up here, than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince. Take the road of humility, my friend. Because he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Singers, musicians, if you could come to the front. I feel like what the Lord is showing us is that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of humility. It's real clear. We talk about it all the time that Jesus was born in a stable. We talked about it Wednesday night, but not only that, he was laid in a manger, which is a feeding trough for animals. Kings, kings, they, kings are born in palaces, man. Not this king. Not the king of kings. Jesus rode in the town on a donkey. But kings ride like stones. Oh, he will. <laughs> He's coming back again, my friend. It's going to be a different story. That's why I want to bow now. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, as this music begins to play, Holy Spirit, we pray that you have your way in our hearts. We thank you for the Davidic king that you sent for us. The one who will one day rule you in the millennial reign on David's throne. Lord, you have called us to be kings and priests upon this earth. We thank you for calling us. Teach us your ways. Teach us humility, O Lord God. Teach us your heart and let us understand that in the midst of our weakness, your strength will be made perfect in our lives. Listen, if you have something that you want to lay down before the Lord and you just want to get into his presence, I just want to encourage you. Amen. These altars are open. Praise God. Hallelujah.